Fab Morvan from Millie Vanilli. Vlad. It's an honor to finally speak to you. You know, for, for me, I, I do a lot of interviews, but, but the most special ones are always the ones of people I was fans of when I was a kid. Right. You know, when I was growing up watching MTV, when MTV actually played music videos and so True, forth. Yeah. And you guys were huge at the time. MTV babies. Yeah. MTV really is what blew you guys up. I think they the did. songs without the music videos would not no, have been the same. No doubt. You know, no doubt. and uh, Girl You Know Is True came out, the visuals of it, it's just, everything just sort of fit into place. Yep. And you guys, you guys definitely did your thing. But let, let's go ahead and start from the very beginning. So Rob was German and you were French. That's right. So this was growing up in the 70s and 80s in France. Yeah. How was it? Was there was a lot of racism during that time, or because no, I know France, Rob Rob mentioned that he, he he dealt with some in Germany. He definitely dealt with a lot, but France is a little different. It was yeah. more, you know, more people from everywhere around the world, from Africa. I'm Creole, you know, the islands. Uh -huh. So we have a, a more international. And living in Paris, which is an international city, you know, yeah. we had everything, you know. So, but he was living in Munich in Bavaria, and Bavaria is kind of a very conservative part of Germany. Mm. And uh, when he was growing up. There were no black kids, so he was right. the only one. Right. So what happened was, at first, you know, got beat up on a lot, but when he became of age and felt himself and got into break dancing, yeah, he got the balls to like, yo, don't don't mess with me. And then he became his philosophy was like, it's better to be feared than to be loved. And I was the opposite. Oh. So we had that yin and yang thing going on. Dope. Now, now he was a break dancer, but you you were not. No, it's not. I, okay. I learned dancing. I studied dancing in a dance school, and that's how, that's how I got into, you know, the love of, of dancing. Music was always in my heart, mm -hmm. but when you're able to just, uh, you know, combine movement and listen to the music and play with your body and express yourself, because right. it becomes an, ex an extension of, of what you are, and then the music comes next, and then you start to sing, and, you know, this is what I want to do. Now, how did the two of you hook up initially? We met in uh, Munich, Germany. At first, I was on his turf. I was the intruder. And then, you know, we realized, like, well, it's better to, uh, if you can beat him, join him. And when we joined forces, it was like, pow! We made a, a splash in Munich, Germany, and everyone knew who we were. At first, we were dating the same girls, and it was like, yo, man, who is he? Who is and it, it was just like a competition. Okay. And it came a time where we just like crossing each other all the time. But there was a certain chemistry. It's like, man, that dude is cool, man. If you could hook up and just like, do, you know, be cool to be, because United, you're stronger. Yeah. And I was just from the outside and the people that I came with in Germany were just scattered. And um, so we just, you know, hung out and we felt like we loved the same thing. We loved music. And I was like, and when we started to speak was, you know, we spoke in English, broken English at first. And, uh, well, because you guys didn't have a common language. You're, you're French, he's German. You guys exactly. didn't really speak English. So how did you guys communicate? Oh, we spoke in English. Oh, in English? Yeah, yeah. Ah, we okay. studied English in school. So, ah. you know, so we, we understood each other, you know. But sometimes it's not what you say, it's what you don't say. So when we started hanging out in the clubs, when there was a track or something that would, that would boom, he was like direct on the dance. I was there, we were there for hours. It was like, he was never leaving. It was always, I was like, man, yeah, man, this is dope. We love, we love this. We love music. So the next step is, of course, to to want to get into the music business. Yeah. And to want to get with professionals. So uh, we were playing soccer with a lot of studio musicians. We used to work with Frank Farian. And uh, from there, you know, we, we asked them, yeah, we, you know, we want, we'd love to, you know, do something with you guys. And they were busy, so during summertime, they had a break and we would rehearse with them and we did a few shows in Munich. Okay. Now, at this point, because at one point you guys were, were models also? Yeah, we did that too. You no, know, okay. we paid the bills with that. Okay. And were you guys successful at that or is it just like little money here? No, it was a little money here and there. We're doing shows as well. We're doing... Um, runway uh, type stuff? Yeah, runway type stuff, catalog stuff. And we were doing some, some dance shows where, you know, it was a whole, it was like a... 20 minutes thing, mm -hmm. and because you have a, a, you have a certain period of time in Germany, which is during fall, it's called fashing. And there is a lot of, lot of jobs are coming in, so we... Like fashion week, basically? Uh, no, it's more carnival. It's called ah, fashion. Okay. 
gotcha. but it's carnival. And during that time, throughout Bavaria, they celebrate like crazy. You have Oktoberfest during that period. Gotcha. And there's a lot of jobs coming in, so we say, hey, why not do like a, like a 25 minute show? And then and I was doing Michael Jackson. <laughs> You know, so everyone was, was doing Michael Jackson. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, and we had a few, few like you know, about twenty minutes, and we were working it and stuff. And when that died, died out, and we were doing, we met more people, so and we we do catalog stuff, and uh, just had to survive. But but the main focus for us was like, yeah, we got to get with professionals. So when we performed with the band once, finally people found us. Like, oh yeah, we heard. Like, yeah, uh -huh. you should come to the studio, and that's how we started getting into the business. Now, at which point did the name Millie Vanilli come about? That was before you guys started. No, that working. was that was with Frank. That with was Frank. with the producer. Yeah. Okay, so you guys weren't called Millie Vanilli. Before. No, 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 no. Okay, so so you guys are just a group. Did you have a group name before Millie Vanilli? No, it was just Robin Fab. Robin Fab. Yeah. Okay. So you guys go and you hook up with Frank uh, Farian. Is that how you pronounce That's it? That's right, Frank Farian. Frank Farian. So what's interesting about Frank Farian is that. He was an established producer already. Yes, big right? time. Boney big M. Time. Boney M. Enormous. Right. Now, Boney M actually has a very interesting story in the way that it connects with you guys. Exactly. Now, Frank Farian, who is a white German producer, exactly. goes and... Picks. Well, he does a song himself with his own vocals. Yeah. But instead of putting himself as the singer, yeah. he goes and finds four Caribbean people, yeah. right? That's right. And has them essentially lip syncing. Well, just one of them. One of them? Just one of them, Bobby Farrell. The, the rest were female vocals. Okay. So he went to the studio, did his thing. I don't know exactly what happened with Bunny M, but the male vocals were done by Frank. So you have, a, you have the producer, a white, a white singer doing the vocals that a black lead singer is now lip syncing. That's right. And Boney M ended up getting huge. Listen, man, they sold over 120 million records. 120 I, I believe million. that they're one of the few with, the di with diamonds. Diamond, yeah. One of the few. And their big song was? Uh, they had a few my big Baker, songs. Uh, phew, there's so many, man. But my Baker was for me growing up in Paris. That was one of the biggest ones. Actually, Lady Gaga, Took that that ma, 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 took that sequence and put it in her song. Oh, so that's actually a Boney M. Yeah. Kind of sample in a way. It is. Okay, so Frank has had experience already before he met, meets Billy Vanilli to take someone else's vocals and have a front man yeah. for those vocals, and he's had tremendous success with that. Tremendous, and tremendous. which allowed him to have four studios. SSL, SSL, Neve, yeah. with a whole rack. Right, and these are million dollar mixing boards you're talking about. Let's not forget about that. Yeah. And that was back in the days. Back in the days. So when he got into his studio, there was like, you know, gold records. He worked with Toto, he worked with Terrence and Darby. Actually, Stevie Wonder Stevie recorded, Wonder, yeah. um, I just called to say I love you. I just called to say I love yeah. you in that studio. A lot of people throughout Europe, his compound was very famous for the quality sound that he would produce out of there. So a lot of people went through there. Okay. So he meets you guys. Yeah. And how does the relationship initially start to form between you and Frank? Well, the relationship with Frank started like as, uh, you know, he was the father figure. He was the man. He has the recording studios, the gold records on the wall. So we get in there, we think like, yo, everything's on the up and up. You ain't gonna do nothing. You know, so when it was time to like sign a contract, yo, it's a sign. A little bit of money. Okay, cool. How much money was it? Man, it was fifteen hundred Deutschmark at the time. Which was which is you know, peanuts like nothing. A few hundred dollars. You know, like thousand dollars or something, you know? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. And, but for us at that point, you know, we ain't got nothing. So, you know, you, you just put your name down here, there was no attorney. No management. Right. We're just like, where do we sign? You but, know? Did you, but did you guys have any music at this point? or No, we, we did some things, but it was... Some demo type stuff. Yeah, some demo type stuff. Okay. You know? So he meets you guys, and he... Does he see the vision right away, or does it take a little while for no, it to No, he form? did, he did. The yeah. thing is, we walked into a trap, not knowing it was a trap. 
Okay. That dude was only looking for one thing, only. Can they perform and what do they look like? That's all they wanted from us because obviously they had material already recorded. Because what happened was, what I found out, because I worked with one of the original vocalists, we perform in Germany with John Davis, and he told me that the way it started on his end was like Frank called him because he would, he would work with Frank constantly, you know, all the time. And he called him and he thought it was just a reg another one of those projects where he would sing on. So the dude recorded, and then after that he, he would come back and he would say, yo man, I know that voice, I know who's singing. The other vocals are like, no, you don't. And it was kind of like secretive type, type mm -hmm. stuff. And he would wait like, so what's up? He would call Frank and say, what's up with the project? He's like, oh, nothing right now. So Frank would get the vocals and I would build the tracks. And I would call people again and it would do in that order. Okay. And then what would happen, like, yo, they would, eventually we came into the picture, and when we got started with the project, and that thing went crazy haywire, then they were in the studio working on the album. They were, like, cranking them. Because right. Frank was, like, clear on, I got something right there. With so the music. With the music, you know, and, and, and with his plan, like, I got the puzzle. Together I got those boys, I got the music. You know, they won't know what, hap what happens. You know, we'll get to that in a second. But they were working hardcore. Four studios working. So you guys get signed to Frank as, yeah. as Millie Vanilli. But he's working on the music completely separate from you guys. You exactly. guys aren't involved in the creative we process don't know that. at all. We figured that out like you figured later. Out afterwards. Okay. Yeah. So when does the Millie Vanilli name come about? Uh, that came together with, uh, with you know, we loved a group called Scritti Politi. Okay. You know, English band mm -hmm. yeah. from the 80s, late 80s. And, um, you know, when we came up with the name, you know, we thought ice cream, vanilla, you know. And then uh, there was uh, the, when someone that used to work for Frank, her name was Millie. And then somehow, after going back and forth, we, we did Millie Vanilli, and it sounded like, because it was two guys, you know? Yeah. So it felt like Millie Vanilli, but we've, 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 we created it like this, like, okay, Millie Vanilli, but afterwards we were like, oh no, that's, that's the name of the group, and people would always say, so who's Millie, who's Vanilli? Mm. But we didn't intend that like okay. that. When we created it, it was like, yeah, maybe, you know, two things. But what I had read that it means positive energy in Turkish, is that any truth? Yeah, that, that so, someone told us that, you know, so we're like, so we ran with it. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things you run with it until Are people sure come to you and says, uh, nah, dude, it ain't. <laughs> oh, so it doesn't actually mean that? No. Okay. So it's just a made-up name? Yes, a made-up name. And it worked? And it worked, yeah. So, you guys are in there and, you know, Frank is sort of masterminding this whole, this whole project. Yep. Now... I come to find out as I'm doing the research for this interview that Girl You Know Is True was actually released by a U.S. group from Baltimore called New Marks. That's correct. And I looked up the song and it's still on YouTube. Yeah. It's the exact same song. Like there's very little, like I, I could see a few subtle changes in right, it, right, but right, it's right. almost exactly the same in terms of the click, vocals. Click, click. Yeah. But the production. We're talking about Frank Farian and his yeah. production, then... It's a little different, but I feel like the, the general melodies... Oh, no, it's general, are, yeah. Are, ...is pretty much there. Overall, and, you know, who's, yes. Who's, who's, you know, 100%. Who's ever watching this could actually look it up and you, know, you can right. see what I'm talking about. So, what's interesting about the group New Marks is a Baltimore DJ crew, and one of the guys in New Marks is Kevin Lyles. I know. Kevin Lyles, who went on to become the president of Def Jam the executive vice president of Warner Brothers. That's right. And he's still, uh, you know, I, I, I know, you know, I run into Kevin every so often. The and, man uh, with the Air Force One. Yeah. Because he collects Air Force One. Yep, right? yep. And I, I think he, now he manages Trey Songs and a, a bunch okay. of other artists as well. Right. So, did you actually know Kevin Lyles or did you no. know anything about New Marks or anything else like that at the no, time? No, I knew about the group. I you knew did? about that. Later, I found out later. about everything Okay, but later. at the time you had no idea. No idea. Because I guess what had happened was New Marks had a few somewhat local hits, they released Girl You Know Is True. In the US it didn't really do anything, but then in Germany it started to build somewhat of a buzz. That's right. And they're saying that Frank probably heard the song in Germany. Yeah, Frank used to go to his club in, uh, in Frankfurt 
and know there were American base in Frankfurt. A lot of Americans were there. Yeah. And Americans would, would go and hang in clubs where they would play American music. So Frank used to hang out there and checking out the music. That's how he got his music and that's how he checked out the people. Even when he created music, he would print a vinyl, go to the club and check it out. Like, yeah, I'd be like, mm, okay, I need to fix this, I need to fix that. But from that club, that's where you heard new marks. Right. Because he used to work with DJs. Right as well. And what's interesting, I guess, is that after Kevin Lyles went through, you know, co-writing the song and then right. trying to collect royalties and having all these problems, that's what actually caused him to go and to move business. to New York. And go into business. And go into business with the music industry and then went, went on to become the president of Def Jam. Did you I ever sh- meet Kevin at, at some no, point? No, I never met him. You never, never met him? Kevin. No, I never Crazy. met him. Crazy. <laughs> you know, I, I believe in something. Action equal reaction. Yeah. Always. You know, and sometimes, you know, you just, a situation can, can, can either make you or break you. But if you stand tall through it, stand mm-hmm. up and, and, you know, get back to it, you know, you can do your thing. Yeah. You're stronger than Nietzsche. What doesn't kill you, make you strong, makes right. you stronger. So, girl, you know is true. When you heard it, did you hear the New Marks version or did you hear no, no. Frank's version? How it was... The first time I heard Gurren Ostu was instrumental. Okay. Stuff was banging, like, whoa. In the big knee, like, he blared, he sat in his chair, be like, check this out, boom. And we were like, whoa. I could, I mean, I could see myself, like, I was like, you know, I love music, I taste, I felt music, and I felt like that was a dope track. Okay, but there's no vocals yet. There's no vocals yet. Even though the vocals had already been recorded on the American yeah, yeah. version. If I, knew the, if I knew how a board would work, I would have seen that that was muted. <laughs> <laughs> well, because he had, I guess, reconstructed the, vo- the, the instrumentals and everything at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what happened was, it was all sunshine in that room when we played that track. And then we went to another room, and that's when the dark cloud came in. And that's when he kind of like told us, listen. And I didn't speak German at the time. So he speaks to Rob. Okay. And I'm trying to decipher. I knew a little bit, you know. So I'm trying to figure it out. And those guys are like arguing. I see Rob's eyes going like, Rrr. and then the dude's like, Rrr. and then Frank gets out of the room. <gasps> you know, he's like, what's going on? And then he looks at me and tells me, oh, he wants us to like lip sync. And I'm like, what is he talking about? Like, you know, we signed a contract. And I'm like, I, I don't get it. You know, and I'm like, no, I ain't doing that. So we get out of the room. He's like, man, we ain't doing that, you know? And so we went back to our hotel. And we're like, so what do we do, you know? Is it, this stuff is crazy. And then they, they called us and then they told us to come back. And it went like that, like, we received money throughout the month. So while they were working, we got money to pay the rent, you know, make their hair, buy some okay. clothes, because their hair was important. Right, because initially you guys didn't have the braids. No, we didn't. Okay, you guys said what, just short, short haircuts? Yeah, we were shorter. Yeah, 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 okay. for sure, for sure. Whose idea was, was the braids? Well, what happened was uh, in 1987, I believe, on New Year's Eve, we were watching a documentary about pop icons. And it was very obvious to us from Elvis Presley, Melly Monroe, you know, Bob Marley, and so on and so on. Their identity, you could, you, you'd know who that was because of the hair. So we were like, hmm, you know, there's something to that. We got to do that. Because, you know, we wanted to get into music business and we thought, like, you have to have a certain identity. What do we do? So we said, yeah, let's try that. You know, and when we tried that, man, the girls went crazy. <laughs> I like, guess it was I mean, we were getting action, but it was like, whoa, <laughs> that's the right decision. Right, because you had mentioned uh, Terrence Trent Darby. Was yeah. he out before you? Yeah, he was out before right. us. Right, he had... That's right, he had it He too. had braids already yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, 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 yeah. it worked for him. It worked for him. So looking at, at that part of, you know, like pop icons, you know, they're always something that sticks out to you. And we thought, well, let's, let's try it out. Okay. So you guys hear Girl You Know Is True. Yeah. And you're told that you have to lip sync it. Yeah. You go back to the hotel room. What happens next? Well, the call is back. We come back, and that's when uh, we're told that it's okay if you don't want to do it, but you need to pay us back. <laughs> so it's like, oh, okay, but we ain't got no money. How, how much was it? Like 
few thousand or? No, it was a little more, man. It was like 50,000? maybe five, maybe. Not that much money. Not but, that much but money. But two, two broke kids, it was, you know, it was all like, the money in the world. It's like, what are we going to do? We're going to, you know, like, what are we going to do? Like, you know, we're going to have to find a job. And we, we, ain't, we ain't trying right. to hear that. But we didn't know that. We, we heard the track and we're like, wow. You know, yeah, we, we thought the most positive thoughts. But when that happened, everything became like, I'm going to get out of here. So it's like, okay. We do the job, so, you know, you just work, you pay me back. You, know, you do it, you pay me back, and then, you know, you're done. Hmm. So it's right. like, oh, that sounds good. But we're against the wall. You guys agreed to do the lip syncing, but it was only just to pay back the money that you owe. Yeah. You guys didn't say, okay, we're going to be a lip syncing group. No. It was like, let's do this and let's get out of there. But then it went crazy. You guys agreed to do the lip syncing, but it was only just to pay back the money that you owe. Yeah. You guys didn't say, okay, we're going to be a lip syncing group. No. It was like, let's do this and let's get out of there. But then it went crazy. Okay. So, Girl You Know Is True was one of the songs, but there was a bunch of other songs. That came later. Okay. But, but Girl You Know Is True was just, so that got released as a single first? That was the first, yeah, yeah. It was just, no, and that's what he said. He said, hey, would you do, no, we signed a contract. We didn't even know. You know, we, I remember, I told you, no manager, no attorney. Okay. So we signed this contract. That was pretty thick, but we never looked inside. We were signed for three albums. Mm. At this point, we don't know the industry. We're like totally right. naive, but we and, trust and the guy. And you guys are, are, I mean, to be fair, coming from where you guys are coming from with no hit records, no experience, you, you didn't really have a bargaining chip here. Nothing. You know what I'm saying? So... Yes, you probably signed a, a bad contract, but at the time, you know, people also have to understand about the music industry is that 90% of the projects a label puts out ends up losing money. That's and 10% right. ends up making money, which is why uh, a record label is almost required to have uh, contracts that may not be great for, for the people that do make money. Exactly. Because in general, they do lose money. Yes, generally. Yeah. Generally. Ninety yeah. percent. It's one of the worst businesses to be in. You're better off with a lottery ticket than a. <laughs> and now <laughs> you got. And now you got three sixty now. No, yeah, so it's even worse. That's another story. Exactly. But, so uh, okay, so you guys agreed to do "Girl You Know Is True." Yeah. As a single. Now, even though the single came out in Germany under new marks, I guess it didn't really go anywhere. So they're able to essentially put it back out yeah, on exactly. a more major level. That's right. BMG um, at the time. BMG. Okay. Yeah. Machine. You had the machine behind Muscle. you. Muscle. So you go and put out Girl You Know Is True. Now, were you performing it in Germany? No, what we did, we did a small, we needed to do a video. So we went to a local TV station and recorded some, something, you know, like, you know. Uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen it anywhere. But we did that thing, and that thing in that part of Germany lit up. And that's when Frank was like, yo, we got to do a real video. We're going to spend some money now. We're going to do it for real. And we were like, whoa. So, you know, we got a taste. Of the fame. You know, you know when you get a taste? Yeah, that was the first time. Yeah, first time. You know, suddenly, you know, people say your name. The, the, the amount of girls that are, the traffic is, is getting bigger. You know, you, you can enter any clubs. You know, you're at the hotel, you dial two numbers, the food comes up, wow. You can mess up your room, have a party, open your fridge. Oh, there's no, oh, it's not enough. No. Okay, let's call front desk. <laughs> they fill it up. I mean, that's the life. Yeah. So you go from having nothing to, to be this, this guy, this dude that's like on television. You're loved by everyone. You're like the mayor. Everywhere you go, people sh want to shake your hand. They want to be with you. They want to hang out with you. It's heaven, so you taste that thing, you know? And yeah. then, then it's time for a single number two. And that is? That is Baby Don't Forget My Number. Okay. So when Baby Don't Forget My Number comes around, we're like, yo, you know, we want to, you know, in our mind, you know, naive, like, no, we got to do this now. He looks at us like, we can't, man. We can't change the voices. And we're like, oh. Oh, so you guys wanted to actually do the vocals moving we, forward. Yeah. You know, we were stopped at the beginning, but then second, we're like, yo. And we told him, we want to do that. Oh, yeah. You know, they brush it up, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, of course. We, you know, okay, cool. So in our mind, it's, it made, okay, we do this and then, but I was totally delusional. But in our mind, you know, hoping and wanting to just be the, to have the full package, live your dream fully. Yeah. Right now, we're just living like part of the dream. But we loved performing so much. And we did a tour in, in, in America, like a 107 city tour in eight months. So, Girl You Know Is True blows up in Germany. Yeah. All over Europe or just Germany? No, it, go, it blows up in Germany and then it spreads out slowly but surely to each territories, Holland, Spain, Italy. Yeah. And that's when, when, we, when we rose to the, to the top of the European charts, then it started crossing over to America. So, that's before the second single? No, first single. First single, yeah. So, the first, so Girl You Know Is True is starting to get played in America as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So then the second single is getting ready to come out, and Frank tells you once again you're not going to perform on it. Yes. Did they try to play around with your vocals at all? Or? No, man. No, he just said they forget it. They weren't trying to hear that at all. Okay. Like, dude had his very strict plan. And he had his group of American, older American musicians... Some of them were kind of heavy set, not exactly photogenic, but they had the chops to do what they needed they to do. They had the chops, and you know, like, you know, those guys were cool looking, you know, but to Frank's plan, yeah. it was not fitting the bill. Okay. Those guys were going to be on the front, and those guys were going to be in the back. So then the second single, once again, you guys aren't on it. But you're, you're loving the ride so far. You're loving the ride. So you can't get off the ride. You cannot have. <laughs> At this point, you've been seducted. Okay. You know, you've been seduced by that thing, that life. You know, yeah. it's that life. And it, it feels good to be there, you know. It, you travel the world. But, it, but after every show, you come back to your room. After people leave the room, after the, after the party, there's an after party, after party, after party. And at the end, when everybody's gone, it's you. You alone. And that's when... Reality sets in, and it's ugly. Well, the second single comes out. Yes. In Europe again, or? Oh, then I think it went boom. Then, okay. then they went like, you know, world. Okay, well, because the, the deal with Arista, did that come after the first single? Second? Everything was worked, um, I believe, that while Milvanelli was rising in Europe, talks were already taking place right because they could tell like yo we're going we're going to the top of the charts in Europe you guys the logical sing- ways to right. go to the other side right because you, you guys are singing in English <laughs> even That's though you're, right. you're technically a German group exactly and London was popping mm-hmm. so you know when you when London's popping then automatically it's New York yeah you know for the DJ you know the cycle you know? yeah boom London New York and then from New York it starts to pop to the rest of the country and then every other radio session starts to to, yeah. you know, to play it, essentially. So when we went on the first time, we went to New York, we were going, no, it's true. Yeah. And we were on the radio on, on the way to, to New York, leaving uh, the airport. It was like Millie Vanilli on, on two or three stations. It was crazy. We were just... Okay. Woo. And you guys had the Arista deal at this point? Yeah, we did. But all that was worked out okay. ahead of time. Because you guys didn't actually sign an Arista. No, no. Frank... And his production company signed. Yeah, to we were signed to a production deal to Frank Farney. Yeah, Frank so. was signed to BMG. And then he signed to Arista. To Arista. Right. Clive Davis. Clive Davis, exactly. Ooh. So, I mean, even though you guys aren't directly signed to Arista, you guys are now Arista artists. And this was yeah. at the height of Arista. Wasn't like Whitney Houston yeah. at the time? Yeah, that's right. On Arista? Like, what other artists were on Arista at the time? Oh, man, I don't remember. Because as a matter of fact, when we came around, you said at the height... But it wasn't. It was a dip. It was a dip. Yeah, there was a dip at that moment. So when we came in, we fell in like, hmm. we blew them up again. But there was a little dip. With okay. me, it was, it was not. So it was, it was just like a, so we came in at the right time for them. Okay. And by the time, by that time, because you said the second single had already come out, right? Yeah. And how was that single doing compared to Girl You Know Is True? Doing great. Doing great. Doing great. And you guys put out four singles. Yes. And the singles are? Girl, you know it's true. Baby, don't forget my number. Blame it on the rain. Girl, I'm going to miss you. All, all four singles go to number one. The album comes out and sells 
Six million copies? Or more? I think it was seven. Seven million? Yeah. In the U.S.? In the U.S. Internationally, how big does it do? 14 million albums and 33 million singles. 14, so you go diamond <laughs> on this album and you go triple diamond <laughs> on the singles. I mean, not exactly triple diamond, but you know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. 33 million singles. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy, man. So, if you just do the math, let's say you wholesale albums at $10 each, you guys made like half a billion dollars on, on just, just the, the music sales or so. Lots of money. Right, not including all the other money around the tours and the merchandising and whatever else. Yeah. So you guys are money machines at this point. Pretty much, yeah. Now, at this point, at the height of it all, describe to me what's going on with you guys. Ooh, we're totally dysfunctional, man. We're like, in order to forget the pressure that we were on because we were not happy. You see, it seems from the outside like everything is hunky-dory, like they're on the road, they're working, the fans are screaming, they're on the radio rotation, they're on MTV, but we wanted to sing. And at first, you know, like I said, we got, we, we say no, we got a taste, and then we stayed in there. And then one single, two single, three singles, and we're starting to like, and then we were not into alcohol, any drugs, but then in order to, to cope with the situation, End of schedule. Mm -hmm. You know, we start drinking. Okay. And um, doing drugs. What kind of drugs? Coke, pot, and so on and so on and yeah. so on. Everything you can name on the board, on the menu, we did. It was just, you know, we need to escape that, that pressure. It was becoming too difficult. And the fact that we couldn't share the secret. So we had that thing like tucked in like to the side and we can share with nobody. So we, we hang out with people, but then we have to like, oh, take a step back because we don't want people to find out what's, what's going down. Well, well, let's talk about that for a second because Clive Davis is not just a paper music executive. He's actually a musician himself who knows music very deeply. True he, He's produced you know, a lot of music before he became executive. Long history. Long history. He's, you know, I know people that have had to audition for Clive Davis in his office. Like, he is a music guy. This is the guy behind Whitney Houston. Janis Joplin. Janis Joplin. The list goes and on, so on. on and on Warwick. and on. So, yeah. did you guys actually meet Clive Davis at any point? I've seen pictures of you and Clive Davis. No, no, so obviously we met. met. Obviously we met, but we met, uh, we met in this famous office that he had at Arista. It was very dim, the light was dim. Yeah. And then you, you came in there like long desk, pictures of I iconic, you know, icon figures. And then he's there with his glasses, you know, and he's like, you know, really calm and, and just uh, welcome to America. Not really discussing anything, but just welcoming us to the label. Okay. And, you know, he looked forward to, to us do what we do and, and, See what happens. Did he know that you guys weren't actually singing on this album? Because this yes. is Clive Davis. This yeah. is not a you hear, you hear what you just said. Here. You hear what you just you just said right now. This is Clive Davis. If a pen dropped in the building, he knew. Yeah. So he who knew. dropped it. So you know, come on. He knew. Yeah, man, come on. Yeah, he knew. You know. So uh, I don't know the details behind that. You see. That's been, that's one of the things that's been kept really, really, really secret. I don't know how it went about like saying, because they had to, to disclose that to him. Right. I mean, but, he's, he's the president of, of Harris the Records. Yeah. So, but I guess he said, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's, let's do it, man. Let, let's, like, -shang. Let, let's get that paper. You know, we'll see what happens later. Obviously, because when, when everything went down, well, everybody was gone. The platinum records on the records were pulled down real quick, I, I heard, because I, right. I met a, I talked to an executive that was over there. He was like, yo, man, when that happened, it was like, cluck, cluck, cluck. So, you guys are on fire. Four hit singles, diamond album, 
everyone was down with Millie Vanilli. And I think what made Millie everyone Vanilli... Everyone their mama. Yeah. What made Millie Vanilli kind of work at the time was that hip-hop was still building. Exactly. And so you, you know, and you were the rapper in the group. <laughs> and uh, Rob, I guess, was the singer. That's right. You know, visually. That's right. And um, it was sort of this interesting kind of hip-hop, R&B, pop kind of fusion. Combo fusion, yeah, yeah exactly. Bell Bib DeVoe did something kind of in the same vein, I feel, between yeah. the rapping and the singing and so forth. You know, Bobby Brown, you know, like exactly. different groups were kind of playing around with it and you guys kind of nailed that sound of well, rapping and singing and so Frank, forth. Frank really, you know, a student of the game, yeah. obviously, student of music. And he saw this, this niche market. He was like, yo, I'm gonna put this like this. And he was 100%, he was right. right. So he knew, like I said, from the start, he had, that, he had that idea, this plan, very precise plan, and he did execute it perfectly. Mm -hmm. I found out later that he, he knew something would, would happen, was going to happen, but he didn't know how big it would get. Right. But he had the right idea. So you guys are out promoting your music. Yeah, and worldwide. Er worldwide. I remember as a kid watching an MTV performance with you guys. And afterwards, you know, on MTV, you give like a shout out. Hey, this is Millie Vanilli. Shout out to MTV, something, something. And I remember as a kid watching this and seeing the two of you do this. And I thought, these guys can't speak English. You heard it. I heard it right away. Right. And it was like, I'm like, this right here already doesn't make sense. Because cause the English was still pretty bad. Like, the way you're talking to me now was not the way you sounded back then. No, no. No, it was very thick. Like, you guys, yeah. like, it almost seemed like it took a few takes to, <laughs> to sort of get that shout and out. Said, we were end. fresh off the boat, man. Yeah, you were fresh success, off the boat. Success came in and said, yeah, yeah. you got to get, you know, it's time to take yeah. the boat. Let's go. The, the accents so, were very, very thick, yeah, very thick back then. Yeah. And I remember thinking in the back of my mind saying... Uh, this doesn't sound like the same guys I'm hearing on the record because on the record the English is perfect. Yeah, exactly. And these guys are talking; it doesn't it doesn't sound that way. So I'm thinking in the back of my mind, something seems off. But who am I? I'm I'm a kid. I have no no influence. Whatever else. Those musical ears you had early on in the game. Dude. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, I guess when that happened, it did get on certain people's radar. Yeah, you know, well, people started to notice. Something isn't quite matching up here. Living Color. Right? In Living Color? Yeah. Okay, what Living happens Living Color did a sketch on Millie Vanilli. I think you can find that on YouTube. It was, uh, it was pretty crazy too. We were in London and uh, at a hotel and uh, we were like partying. We were like a bunch of people in the hotel, like, you know, lavish lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Table is full of food, everybody's just loving it, champagne, alcohol, well, you name it. And we're, we're clicking channel, and then I'm clicking channel, I'm like, yo, that looks like Rob and I. Like, it looks like a spoof, I'm looking, I'm like, but he ain't looking good to me. So I'm like, yo, shut up, we need to hear this. And we look at this, and we're like, whoa, I ain't liking that. You know, we would cut the, the last part of the sketch, and we were like, mm. So suddenly, it was kind of like, yo, man, people are like getting, we, they're getting close. Okay. So, and Living Color does a sketch basically making fun of your accents. That's right. And then, Arsenio got on it too, got hip to that. And he would go after us. Because what happened was, the original singers, Went on the show. I, I don't know if it was in or Geraldo, whatever. Like there was an interview that was that was given, and it was Charles Shaw, because the one thing people don't know is that Girl Know Is True, the rapper on Girl Know Is True was not the same rapper as the other song. Frank kicked the dude after the first single. Okay, that's what happened. Because he was talking about. No, there was some some problems between okay. them. But what happened was he got he opened he started opening opening his mouth. And then the other people that were involved in the project started to like get on the bandwagon. So rumors are coming. Yeah, rumors are coming. They're creeping. And then there's a show that happens and the CD starts to skip. Well, let me hold you there. No, that happened afterwards? That was, you know, we did a, a special 
with uh, VH1 Behind the Music. Mm -hmm. And that was something that they put, it was a nice edit, it's great for TV. But that day really happened, but it didn't change our lives because that was at the beginning of our career in America, uh -huh. on MTV tour with Julie Brown. Uh -huh. So down, what happened downtown was- Julie Brown. Downtown Julie Brown, sexy downtown Julie <laughs> Brown. And uh, what happened was, the tr the, yeah, the computer skipped, and then it was not my part, so I was chilled. It was like, oh, yes, well, you know. So he was pissed, so we went backstage, and they were trying to fix the problem. Two minutes, because we were known for the skipping. You know, back then, they used to do yeah. the repeat and all that. So we just went back out there and did the thing, and it was no big deal. No big deal at all, okay. That's not what started at all, but right. for TV It purpose, was those skits. It was nice. Okay, but it was those skits, and people talking and everything else like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. But you guys are still plowing along and still, still doing working. your thing. Did the American Music Awards happen first or the Grammys? American Music Awards. American Music Awards happen. You guys win three American Music Awards. Bam. Which, uh, which awards Armful. was it? It was like Best Pop Artist? Best Pop, I can't recall everything, my brother. Okay. No. But, you, but that was, the, was that the first awards that you guys had won? Yeah, that was, okay. uh, yeah. We did some small ones, but that was like. Right, it was America. It's America. How did it feel to win those three awards? It was amazing, man. It's, it's hard to describe, you know, because, you know, you get those awards and you're ecstatic, but the minute you touch it, it's like, it feels like, tick, 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 that's, okay. just going, that, that's going to blow up in your face at some point. At one point, Rob did an interview with Time Magazine. Oh, that one. And he said that here we go. You guys have contributed more to pop music than Bob Dylan, <laughs> Mick Jagger, <sighs> and Paul McCartney. Oh my God! Now oh my you know. God. Listen. Oh my God! They even, say Rob, even, right? They say Rob, Rob, right? It wasn't Rob. you. It wasn't you. Okay. It wasn't you. Okay. And listen, clear. even if you guys did all the vocals, that was kind of a, a ridiculous statement. Okay, let me, uh, let someone, me, someone with one album really can't say that nah. they contributed more than Paul nah, McCartney of you, the Beatles. Let me give you a backstory. <laughs> First of all, uh, you know, we had partied heavily the night before. You know, still drunk, as a matter of fact, still high. Okay. And we get to the interview, and, um, you know, Rob spoke English well. I spoke better and understood better. And sometimes he put his foot in his mouth. He was misunderstood. He never said those words. What did he say? We were fans of Bob Dylan and the Beatles. You know, we were fans of it. What he was trying to say, you know, he was trying to say the, on, on the pop level, like, we, you know, we affect people, the fans. And, but the journalist was like, yo, Maybe he already knew. He's like, yo, that's a great story for me. I'm going to get on the map. I'm going to get on the map with that. <laughs> like, right, let me do this. Let me do this. Because, you know, we, we actually try to get the tapes. Mm. You know, because you, you recorded the whole thing. Like, we want to get the tapes. Please give us the tapes. Let us, you know, let me, l let's hear the conversation. Yeah. Because I know. I would have said, like, yo, man, you crazy or what? Are okay. you crazy, dude? So that, I mean, so, so that's a rumor. So that was, you know, yeah, that was never actually said by Rob. That's either, a flip, man. By Rob. Taken out of context. Taken out of context. Uh, okay, I mean, listen, you're, you're completely honest with everything else, so there's no reason no, yeah. for you to, to lie about this small, small part of the story. It's ludicrous, man. Come on. Man. So, you guys win these three American Music Awards. Yeah. And that's nice, but then the Grammys come. Now, yeah. every year when you have the Grammys... There's a lot of categories in the Grammys. True. You know, they give out dozens of Grammys for... Some we don't even know about. Yeah, best comedy album. That's right. Uh, you know, best spoken word book. You know, best audio book. There, there's a lot of... And they don't make the cut on TV edit. Right. But there's four major awards. Important, yeah. And one of those awards is best new artist. That's Kiss of Death. For many, it's been. Chance the Rapper just won Best New Artist in the, oh, this, the, the, pa the Grammys right. that just passed. He's dope. Being, you know, having the Best New Artist Grammy is the biggest award you could get as a new artist. It's a medal of honor. So you guys go and win the Best New Artist Grammy. H how did it feel to go up on that stage and accept that award? That was a crazy moment because uh, we didn't expect it. I remember watching the footage. We were front row. And my, my heart just sunk. I was like, oh no, 
oh no, now we have to go accept this in front of the world because obviously the Grammys is the pinnacle, that's the top. Yeah. Always, it's always been like that. So for us to receive that was like, I looked at him, it's like, oh, so you gotta play it off. Yeah, let's go do this, let's get it, you know? And Rob, what he said that night, you know, when he received the award, we took it, and it was like for all the artists out there, you know, it was for, for other artists. We couldn't even, yeah, you know, we were accepting it. It was like, why? What did we say? We gonna <laughs> come out like, yo, you know, right, like live on TV? And was, no, we don't do that. It was like, Phew. well, I actually watched it, and uh, it, it's very ironic what he said. He said, there are a lot of other artists in this room, and outside of this room that could achieve the same award. So in a way, he was almost saying it without saying it. He was it. saying it without seeing it. We had to do that. Hmm. You know, so, so that was a conscious thing that you guys, or a spur of the moment. No, it's spur of the moment, because yeah. you know, for us, like, just, like, we got the American Music Awards, and already we had this conversation, like we're talking like, yo, oh, man, pff, that ain't right, that ain't right, that ain't right, that ain't right, you know? So when we got on the stage, Obviously, we had to say that. We couldn't say, hey, thank you very much, you know, and now that you, you, you recall the words for me, mm -hmm. yeah, it's exactly how we felt. Like, you know, this is for you. You know, we, we stood for the dream because we came out from Europe, Germany, and be here, being here on that stage in America receiving, you know, this award, a Grammy of all award, was amazing, and that's why we said what we said. We felt guilty, huh? So and you we carry that guilt, like yeah. I said. We use, and after that, oh my dude, it was just like the path to destruction because we knew the wolves were coming. Okay. They were going to get us. Because you win the Grammy for Best New Artist. Yeah. You accept the award, you take the pictures, you, you do the, the interviews and so forth. And was it four days later? You give it back? Well, what happened was we, d we did an interview with a journalist from the Los Angeles Times. And uh, we said, you know, we're going to give it back. So you guys win the Grammy for Best right. New Artist. Then a few months later, Frank makes this huge announcement. That's right. Why did Frank make that announcement? It's a long story, but in a few words, we went against him. And uh, when we sign his contract with him, something real strange happened in that room. Everybody's chill, we're happy, you know, we're drinking champagne and everything. And he turns to Rob and tells him, don't ever try to fuck me. I'm like, whoa, gangster, like, whoa. <laughs> like, whoa. And then he, you know, Rob tells me, I'm like, man, that's kind of weird. And we just kind of like, okay, whatever. You know, we kept drinking and stuff, but that thing stuck in my mind. And when we were going back and forth and butting heads, it came to that point. Like, yo, that dude was like, whatever he had created in his mind was getting out of control because he wanted us to come back and take care of the second album. Right, because we you guys like, had a three album deal. Yeah, yeah. And we're like, hell no, we ain't doing that. No, now we want this, we want this. And we pushed him so hard. Okay. Because we didn't want to continue. So you guys refused to lip sync the second album. Exactly, pretty 100, much. 100%, even though... But we didn't tell him, we were playing with him. Okay. What we did, we said, you know what, we're gonna mess him up. We're gonna, because he wants that money, he wants that second one, he wants that second. Right. But we ain't gonna give it to him, so we're just gonna play him. So he's like, no, we want this now, we want this now. And we're what, staying over here now. What were you asking for? More money. Okay. Because, you know, that's what it comes down to. So he's like, no, we want more. And he's like, no, I'm doing that. You know, he's like, no, that's lit, you know, and all that, you know. But, but hundreds of millions of dollars are being made. I mean, didn't yeah. you guys renegotiate your contract a couple of times along the way? No? No. Okay, you still no, have that's that That's another same. story. Okay, that's another story. But, so you guys are now battling with Frank over the second album, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just, it's pretty much, we made our decision. We ain't doing that no more. Okay. And he took balls. So, you guys are going diamond and so forth hundreds of millions of dollars are being made yeah. you guys are doing these major tours you guys are on tv you guys have these singles how much are you guys profiting yourselves 
Well, By the ha- time the first album is, is now done and the Grammys I, won I, I and everything. I can't give you any precise number, but hear me out. He blocked everything because of the fights we had. So the only way we could make our money was on the road and tour in America. So you, you weren't see? making royalties no, off the No, album. that dude was holding everything. Because you were signed to his production company. Yeah, that's what happened. So in order for, for us to, to have some kind of freedom, we say, yo, man, we out of here. And he was pissed. You know, you're staying here. I'm like, no, man, we're going over there. Because we knew over there we could get the tour going. So we got all we needed from him. He didn't, he didn't think that he would blow up that much, like we would take control of our lives over there. That's what happened. And he was like, yo, you got to get back to Europe. We're like, no, we ain't doing that. We knew that we were not going to do that again. It was crazy okay. to do it again. So he took balls from us to say, like, yo, we're going to leave all that. But the thing that you have to know and that not many people know is that we were in a process of like preparing something else, a transition. We were going to make a transition. And dude, he heard about it. Hmm. So he jumped the gun. Okay. So then it was impossible for anything to happen then. There's a quote from Frank. He says, I made them rich. Rob and Fab got $2 million from us. The record companies were very satisfied. The real singers also got rich. And Frank Farian got even richer. Only Rob wanted much more. No, man. Not true. Not true. You didn't make $2 million. All the money we made was from touring. And, you know, you're talking about there's you guys, there's the production company, there is Arista. Arista has a parent company. Everyone's got their hands in the pie and yep. so forth. By the time it trickles down to Rob and Fab, it's just tour money. And the world tour was being booked. So we were like, yo, forget about that dude because we got the world tour coming. Right, because you just have a, a Grammy, a Best New Artist Grammy. Right, right, right. Everyone wants to fuck with you. Exactly. So yeah. we got, we're lining up like world, Latin America, Asia, everything's gonna go down. And the transition period, the transition that we were working on, but he heard about all that and he was like, I'm not gonna let them get more money. You're not gonna get paper on my watch. And that's when he okay. bam. But by doing that, he didn't just hurt you two, he hurt his own brand as well. But you know what? This is where you see how crazy that dude, that ego was crazy, massive. Because he was like, I don't care about the money at this point. Because he's already rich. He's already rich. Yeah. Okay. But you see how crazy that is? So he, he goes. He stopped it himself. He goes publicly and announces that Rob and Fab don't have any vocals on That's that right. album. That's right. When you first heard <laughs> that announcement, Oof. what went through your head? Relief. Relief. Yeah, it was like, now I can, at first it was relief, it was like, I can, I can walk free. I don't yeah. have to carry that, that, that secret on my back. You know, it's on your back, but it's in your gut. And it's like, you know, it's always like, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? When is the bomb going to explode? And finally, it explodes. So then you, you feel like, whew, but then comes next. You know, action equal reaction. Okay. Well, you felt relieved. How did Rob feel? He wasn't happy. Even though we caused it, he wasn't happy. I wasn't happy as well. I was relieved, but then I was like, ah, damn. You know, now our world is going to change. We didn't know how, how much it was going to change, but it was going to change and drastic, which means in one day, and, and you know, fame as a way to just disappear step by step. But it's a, it's a gradual process. But suddenly, from one day to the next, it's kaboom. You're okay. no longer that, that king. You know, you're like, that guy, he didn't sing on the record. You know, and then the jokes are starting to pop, but like for real. Right. No. I think I remember uh, Yo! MTV Raps did a skit about you guys. I didn't see that one. You, you didn't see that one? I didn't see With that Ed, one. Ed Lover and Dr. Dre? No, I didn't they, see that they, they, one. They, had the, they called themselves Silly Vanilli. Oh, And I man. think that they had the, the braid, wigs, and 
You yeah, know, yeah. I mean, like, listen, man, it's, we were easy targets. Easy targets. Easy, man. I mean, come on. So. Well, so the news comes out. How long after the news coming out did you guys give back the Grammys? Well, you know, everybody wanted to talk to us then. So I think the first people who got to us was Los, the Los Angeles Times. Yeah. I can't tell you exactly, but it went pretty fast. Okay. Yeah. This was the first... And, and let me tell you something that I have to clear mm-hmm. up is like, I like it because you said we give it back because in the press it's always said it was taken away. Yeah. And it was, they said it was taken away because of the fact that when we did that interview with um, the journalist, we told him, hey, we want to give it back. But he had an interview with Naris that same day. They jumped the gun. So then it was like, we want it back. But in reality, we wanted to give it back. Okay. This was the first and only time in the history of the Grammys that a Grammy was returned. Right. You guys did a press conference about it. Yeah, that, that, that thing was insane. I think you started the press conference by actually rapping your part. And girl, you know it's true to try to show people that you actually yeah, no, Actually, can. it was a recording. We recorded some stuff to let people know, like, yo, we can't do this. Okay. Yeah. And I think I remember Rob saying, he, he said, no, really, we could sing. And he, yeah. he sang his, you know, girl, you know it's true. Like, yeah. you know, to the, but at that point, the circus was, Started. In, was in full swing. Listen, it was just, you couldn't stop it at this point. Like, it was just so massive. It was, it was Desert Storm and, and Mil Vanilli <laughs> at that time. You know, it was everywhere. And like I said, we were easy targets. And, but the, you know, what, what, I, what hurt us, what did hurt us the most was um, we felt like we were part of the family. You know, we, there, was, there were a team of, of people, there was staff, there was a lot of people, you know, because yes. it's ludicrous to think that those two guys orchestrated the whole thing. But somehow, we took the whole blame. Right. Everybody went like pointing the finger like, Robin Fett. But like, what the hell, man? There's like those companies, those very powerful companies, right. executives behind. Clive Davis. The Black, the black Clash got to us. Yeah. And uh, I'm Frank telling Farian, you, it was ugly. The singers, the producers, everyone was in on it. Everybody was in on it. Everyone. MTV. <laughs> you know, Everybody. So, so at this point, we're like, thrown to the wolves, hang out the dry, and we have to defend ourselves. Yeah. You know, class action lawsuits. So, all this starts to explode, implode, I guess. Yeah. Um, the Grammy president at the time said, I hope this re- revocation will make the industry think long and hard before anyone else tries to pull something like this again. Come on, dude. Even though Come on. Artists have been lip syncing and on. using auto tune and this, that, and the third. Okay, I'll, I'll give him that. Yes, we didn't sing on the records, right? But, you know, when auto tune came around, this new school, you know, came around the software, then suddenly a lot of people were using it, but to a point where they couldn't, have, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't even perform their own music and vocals on stage. Yeah. So, is there any difference? Today's episode of The Vlad Couch is brought to you by the new Spotify original podcast, Mogul, The Life and Death of Chris Lighty. Hosted by Reggie Osei, AKA Combat Jack, co-founder of Loudspeakers Network. Mogul tells the story of Chris Lighty, the music executive who changed hip hop and shaped the careers of some of the most beloved artists, LL Cool J, Missy Elliott, 50 Cent, Nas, Diddy, and so many more. With one of the most illustrious careers in music, Chris Lighty rose to the pinnacle of music success before an untimely end. The story is more than just music. It's a story of the American dream. Chris Lighty is an absolute legend in this music industry, an incredible story, something that I'm personally looking forward to hearing. I can't wait to check this out. Produced by Gimlet Media and Loudspeakers Network, new episodes of the Spotify original podcast, Mogul, The Life and Death of Chris Lighty, release every week starting April 27th, only on Spotify. So then the lawsuits happened. Yes. There were, I think like 20, 26 lawsuits were filed. There were a lot, man. There was a lot of lawsuits. There was a lot, man. Even, you know what? And it was even a criminal 
charges. Oh, really? You, in one county, like really <laughs> small, you know. Like, they try to like, put you in jail. Yeah, like, like, it's crazy. like well, what's up, what's up? You know, but you know, class action lawsuit, yeah. you know, it's attorneys getting together, they want to get paper. Yeah. So, so I it. remember there was a, a settlement at one point Did where they? Arista agreed, not for a refund, That's right. but, but as a credit for anyone who bought a Milli Vanilli album. And? And single. And? What? And held on, and hold, held on to the ticket stub. Okay, right, yeah. And, and, yeah, and and went to a Milli Vanilli show. They could get a credit for a future Arista release. They can get $3 off a CD, $2 off a tape, oh, man. and $1 off a single. Now, it was estimated that the loss of the label was like $25 million, but how many people really cashed in on this? I don't know how many. I don't know exactly, but it's not compared to what they made. Like, that was... It, it, it sounds like one of these settlements that ultimately don't cost the label anything. No. It just sounds good on paper. It That's sounds right. like they're sorry and whatever. It, because but ultimately, know, no, no one's really going to do this. It's not even a refund. And, and those lawsuits were like, oh, my son can't sleep anymore. <laughs> oh, he's so sad. You know? You're like, what, what, what? And, and what? what? And people got refunds on concerts as well? That I don't know. Yeah, I don't but know. I know that was part of the, one of the lawsuits. That's yeah, part so of that. Far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I, yeah. I, I really kept myself away from, I was just paying my attorneys. Over and over Every again. month, over and over, to be like, get, get, them. because you know, they were trying, they, they were attacking the label, but they were suing us directly as well. You know, so it was like, oh. Oh, so you got to pay all these lawyers' fees. <sighs> yeah. It was, right. Uh, it was hard. Now, at this point, people started to turn against Frank. <clears throat> people started to turn against Frank as well. Yeah. And Frank started to sort of fire back. Yeah. I think one of the things that Frank said was, I have never heard such bad singers. They wanted to sing, they wanted to write songs, it never happened. Instead, they went to disco till 4 a.m. and slept all day. All they ever really wanted to do was party. Someone who lives like that can't make good music. Well, the only true thing about that is we were partying. That's clear. Yeah. As far as him giving us an opportunity, if he had anything on tape or anything, he would have released that already. Right? We were never given the opportunity to do that. Ever. It was, n no, it was not even in, in the plan. It was not in his plan. The plan is, you guys are in front, the boys are in the back. That's it. How were the actual singers feeling about this when all this we happened? We never met. You never met. He kept everybody he kept everyone separate. Separate. Wow. And we and we met like we <clears throat> met one of them real real short. At this point we knew like yo, that must be the guy that was Brad Howe and we met shortly but then he was like, no, those people can't hang out together. So make sure we schedule them at different times mm. at the studio. Before all this happened, correct me if I'm wrong. But when albums came out, the vocalists and, and so forth weren't always credited on albums. Yeah. Is that correct? That's correct. So a year after this happened with you guys, CNC Music Factory put out a song called Make You Sweat. And they had this, this sexy, slim, you know, black girl doing the vocals. Yep. And then we came to find out afterwards that she was not actually doing the vocals. It was a woman named Martha Wash, who was yes. more of a heavy set woman That's who right. actually laid the vocals. She, she was part of a group and they sang uh, It's Raining Men. Right, exactly. And she was, yeah, she was a very accomplished singer on her own, but I yeah. guess they, they felt at the time that, you know, wasn't the right image for this particular group. Like with you guys, Same. very similar situation. Yeah. She sued. CNC Music Factory, and I think the label and so forth. Yeah. She won the lawsuit. Of course. Of course. She had to. Because she wasn't credited at all, I guess. She's crazy. That. And I think that lawsuit, after that lawsuit, you actually had to credit vocals on albums. It was mandatory okay. at that point. It actually changed the laws. The results, okay. And I think that that was, you guys were sort of part of that whole... I didn't know that. You know, avalanche that sort of happened during that time. Because I yeah. guess up to that point... I'm sure this was happening constantly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
for a long, especially in Europe, mm. that was common practice. I didn't know that at the time. But when you know you look at documentaries and you checked, you know, like, oh yeah. wow, did do did did do, yeah. oh wow, 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 wow. But major, major songs, you know, and yeah. some people were never, were were, ne were never caught really. Yeah. After a year, they just mentioned it. Yeah. We talked about it. Now you said you went through a really, really bad depression. Both of us, man. It yeah. was just, um, I, but I, you know, the one thing I, I, I always say this in every interview when they ask me about that, that, that period of time, I tell people that I always foresaw the military train stop. I always saw that happening, hitting the wall, boom, stand still. It's like when you're in a fight, you know, when someone is about to punch, you're like, Ugh. you flex, right? So when the punch comes, you're good. <laughs> but when the punch comes, by surprise, you're knocked out. You don't see it coming. Yeah. And with Rob, he didn't see it coming. We were pushing, you know, we wanted to get out, but he didn't think that it would affect him like that, that it would take everything away. I had a feeling that our life would be totally, it would be night and day. But he thought maybe because of everything that we, we were working on, the world tour was coming, we're trying to work a new situation as far as Rob and Fab singing on a record with another team of producers. But when he hit him, it hit him hard. So he went, I kind of like, I was in the process of stopping everything. I was like, yo, I got to stop the drug part because if I don't do that, the edge is very close and I won't be able to get back up. So I got to stop. So I had that going, but he went just, to okay. forget, because it was painful. Sure. Because then, then after that, it seemed like people tried to sort of pick up the pieces. I guess um, the original vocal vocalists tried to come out with a group called The Real Millie Vanilli. Well, that was done by Frank. Oh, Frank. Frank was behind that whole thing. Frank tried to put out the real Millie yeah. Vanilli? Seriously? Yeah, yeah. Took them on the road. They, they, they released an <laughs> album. They went on the road in various territories, yeah. You guys came out as Rob and Fab. Yes, and that, was, that situation was, uh, you know, we had a manager at the time, he was German, who thought he could handle this thing and take it further. And he got us in a situation with, uh, with this independent label that had no power, that didn't have, they didn't have the money to print records once we did the record. And that's when my new manager came in, Kim Marlowe, and she was trying to fix that whole thing, but we were already signed. So it was like, okay, right. let's do this, let's release one single, let's get a video done, and let's get it done, you know? But we finished this project. And it came out and it sold 2,000 copies. Because there was no records right. in the store. Qu quite a difference from the, the 30 million that you guys yeah, were just used man. to. Yeah, it man, was, it was a brand new, it's like, you know, you have those new glasses on. Yeah. And the world looks very different now. And, and, but you guys are doing your own vocals at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually did some, did some, some, some touring, some club tours, and here and there to let people know this is the new project, this is the new music. Right. You guys went on Arsenio, I think, and Well, Arsenio, what, what Arsenio did, he did a countdown, a one-month countdown, countdown, and, you know, Milvin, you know, Rob and Fab are going to perform. And we did it, and we killed it. Anybody can go back and look at that performance. I killed it, I can say that. And, yeah. and, and guests that came after that were like, yo, Fab did his thing. Rob wasn't there. You know, during the whole process of the record, he had, you know, this drug addiction that kicked him in overdrive. So he was kind of like, now it was, it was deep. And he was trying to get out of it, he was fighting it, but it was very difficult because the pain, he really got, you know, he couldn't recover from the punch. Well, Rob at one point said that he felt like you guys sold your souls to the devil. Well, you know, we kind of we kind of did. Yeah. Really, you know, we not realizing what we were doing. You know, if someone would have told me, you know, like, you know, in the night, yo, we can rewind. Let's rewind this. I'd be like, with everything I know now, let's go back. Dope. Let's go back to the beginning. But that was impossible. Well, but I think 
I don't know if it was you or Rob that said that even if you could rewind it, you might still do it all over again. No? No, man. No? No, man. To go through that? That's crazy. I mean, you went through that, but then also the heights of it. Yeah, but no, man. That's no. painful, man. Okay. That's painful, too. No, I, the only thing I would change out of that would be sing on the record and get Rob out of that drug habit. Okay. That would be like the ultimate. So after you guys put out your own project, the, the Robin Fab project, you are starting to sober up. Rob is in a bad, in a bad state still. Yeah. How is your relationship with Rob? Are you guys still like brothers or Listen, is it? We, we, we're brothers to the end. And I told him, look, you got to clean up, dude. Okay. Because if you want to go back to work, because we went through Robin Fab and I pretty much did every tracks on the record because he wasn't there. He couldn't, you know, deal with it. And it was just too hard. He, he, was, he had gone so deep. It was very difficult to get out of that. And we tried as a team with my manager, Kamalo, to, to help him work walk on this path of recovery but with addiction if you ain't ready yourself if you ain't ready to do it nobody can do it for you well rob not only was doing drugs but he started doing crime well the, the crime happened because of the fact that he wasn't there you know he wasn't there anymore so he was doing things like you know he was high there so he would get arrested right he had he had an assault he had an assault well what happened was i think he he was high got into someone's car i don't really, I, I don't know i don't know if he broke in or the door was open so he went in there slept in there and then the dude was like the hell is that in my car so opened the door rob jumped up and then ran and then ran into his house to, it was a crazy story there was robberies that he was involved in? No, nah, man. No, okay. No. no. Not that I know of. Not that you know of. But he had to go into rehab at one point. Well, he, he, had, he had to do three months in jail. He well, went to jail. He, he, he did rehab. He did a few. Did you know, a few we rehabs. did, I did too. You know. Okay, he you did, did rehab a few, as well. You know, and it, but he, he had jail time also. Yeah. Like three months. Not a huge amount, but Not still. Not much. So. And I getting, thought and I hoped. Yo, it's gonna be good. You do some time, maybe like things are gonna change. Frank comes back. Yeah. And starts to work with Rob. Yeah. Starts to work on his music. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna have you read between the lines. Okay. Why and how? You know. Because Frank came to help out with the situation, you know, with the crime situation. Yeah. Got him out of it, you know. Paid. But you know, you don't get nothing for nothing. Did Frank, were you talking to Frank at all during this time? Hell no. At all. My manager, Kamala, was in, in, in touch with the person that, that, that was working for Frank. Frank never spoke to me directly. Really? Like, no, nah, man. No, we, we, back then we did. Yeah. But when everything went down, it was okay. like, yo, no more. Do you feel that Frank came back because of guilt over the whole thing? Or? Hell no. No, because man. Frank ultimately listen, made it's about, listen, it's a about, lot of millions of dollars. It's about that. It's about that paper, man. Well, that's it for him. I mean, to be fair, I'm just gonna, you know, as a as a third party here. Do it, do it. I mean, because Frank went on to continue to produce music and he was successful and everything else like that, right? Yeah. So. If Frank never worked with you guys again, he would have been okay. Frank, the, the only reason Frank came back into Rob's life and tried to get into my life again was to do the same thing over again. Okay. But how can you do the same thing over again when the cat's already out the bag? I don't know. But he, he, that, he, he, I stayed away from that situation. My manager, Kamala, was, was talking to them. And when I heard that, yo, he wants me to to get back to Germany and I was like, I ain't doing nothing. So you were done with it? I was done with it. But Rob wasn't. Rob entertained it. Listen. He was rock bottom. Rob needed some money. Yeah. You know, and the hand that fed you comes back and be like, yo, here's some paper. You know, what you gonna do? 
if you're in, 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 in Rob's shoes and you got problem, you got drug addiction to go through and, and you wanna you wanna get better but you you know you're in a different place like Yeah. What you gonna do? Now, before this happened, before uh, Frank came back, Rob had multiple suicide attempts. Well, one of them was really a cry for help. Well, he, he slid his wrists at one point. Mm, no? That no, never happened? No. Okay. That I, I haven't heard about you, you, that. You, you didn't hear the about one that. I heard about, well, you know, we were, you know, he it just, he was at um, the Mondrian and it was just, you know, desperation. He had threatened to jump from a nice yeah, yeah, window. Yeah, yeah. You heard about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, for okay. sure. No, we were together at that time, but he, he went to party, went to the Mondrian and just like, went on a rampage, he was clean, and then once he started to mess around with it again, it was like, yo, I know something bad was gonna happen. I didn't know where he was. So Rob tried to commit suicide by jumping off a nine story window. Yeah. And uh, what, people, were you with him at the time? No, I wasn't. I, actually, I was with him before, like in, uh, we were part, I don't know what we were doing. And then he went on his own, because we were not living together anymore. You know, it was like, you got to clean up, my dude. I'm trying to clean up. So if I'm going to be around you, I ain't going to clean up. So we had to like separate. Okay. And um, it's one of those nights. He did too much. And he started to replay everything. You know, when you start to replay everything, it's just, and the jokes were so cold too. You know, like we were just nothing but a joke then. You know, they didn't have like, like we would, People don't realize that when you are this, this celebrity, you know, like, you know, you're the star, but they forget that you have also have, you're not a machine, you're, yeah. you have feelings. You're just yeah. a, you're a, a person. person. Yeah, you're a yeah. person that's been, you know, kicked up to the, to the forefront, you know, and you, yeah, you're on TV, you're on radio, you're everywhere and everything, you know, you're famous, but you're a human being. And um, when, they, when they charge, man, they charge hard and it's hard to, to walk down the street without, it was hard to, to, to feel at ease anywhere because right. it felt like people were laughing. So if I was in a place chilling and I would hear people laugh, I'd be like, hmm. Are they, are they laughing at me? Is that at me? Like, oh, right, because you said you, for a while, you never even left your house unless it was to I go I stayed eat. in my house for a long time. Years? Years. Wow. Like coming out like to go shopping at night, late, and go to the store, like, you know, I know there's not gonna be nobody, but still people are like, hey, you know? And that, that encounter alone, like, I ain't coming out. I ain't coming out next time. Yeah. Next time somebody else can go and get the, the groceries. It's tough. So then in 1998, Rob ends up dying. Yup. So he ended up overdosing on pills and alcohol, but, but people were saying that it was a, a suicide. I personally don't think so. And that's another part of the story that, um, that I still have to investigate. My dude was on his way to, uh, to uh, India to sober up 100%. And he was in a program in Germany that was paid, I think, by Frank, because Frank was courting Rob to do whatever it was he wanted, he wanted to do. And um, for some reason, man, the day of his departure, my dude partied his heart out. So that makes no sense to me. You're about to sober up, but you know, in the mind of an addict, nothing is really clear until you're out of the tunnel. So maybe just like back in the days, we were like, yo, we're gonna stop for one week. So we go cold turkey, one week, nothing. But the week after, it's like, man, double up, bro, double up. So, you know, maybe it's one of those, like I'm gonna do one last time, I'm gonna get high. Oh, because I'm about to go into rehab. I'm about to go clean up 100%. Mm. So I'm going to go hard. So maybe with the medicine that he was on and what he took, the heart just said, no more. Right, because he was only 33 years old. Yep. And you know, it's funny because back in the days we were young, we were like, when everything was heavy, we were like, yo, man, it would be okay to just, you know, check out. You know, young forever. Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley, it's young forever, man. It's like, yeah, man. And I was like, I don't know, man. But he was like, yeah, man. 
fuck, you know, whatever. I was like, I don't know. I, I, I still think that I wanna, I wanna go further here. I think there's more to do. I mean, 33, you, you're still a baby at this oh, point. Oh man, you, you I mean, got you're, so you're, much. You're how old at this point? I'm 50. Yeah, yeah. He missed out on, and he, you guys were the same age, right? He was older. By? Two years. Two years, right, so yeah. you were 31. So he was my big brother. Hmm. You know, growing up together, you know, it's a big difference. Two years at that yeah. age makes a big difference. So he was, he was my, okay, he was the big brother, pretty much. But eventually, when we grew up, then I, I became the big brother. And I tried and tried and tried and tried so many times to, to, have, him, to have him see the light. But he couldn't see it. As much love that I gave him, you know, brotherly love. My dude, I love you. But listen, you got to get out of there because, you know, this is, it can only end, there's only a few scenarios. You know, it's, it's jail, it's cemetery, it's the hospital. And all those avenues, it ain't pretty. But still, and, and he was adopted. And I believe that early on, when we met, there was always that, he had that void, I could see, you know, because he was, he was adopted and um, there was something missing, you yeah. know, and becoming celebrities, you know, pop stars, whatever you call it, it was, uh, it was lovely, <laughs> you know, you know, it filled that void, everybody was loving you, you know, but I grew up, I had my family, even though I came from a divorce background, but I, I feel like I was a little more balanced. Yeah. And he didn't have that. So when everything went off balance, it was just like, wow. It threw him off. When you got the phone call that Rob had passed, yeah. and you were the closest person in his life for... He's the only person that knows what it was like to, to walk in our shoes. Yeah. How, how badly did it hit you when you got that call? Well, Kim Marlowe, my manager, got the call and then she she just like lost her stuff on the floor and then but as she was crying she was on the floor she I heard what she said before that and I knew this moment would come so I just knew it you were surprised you're always surprised when it comes but you knew it was coming but I knew it was coming I was hoping that it would never come but when it came man it was like um, I lost my earring for like a good minute it was like the ears were ringing, it was just like, oof, it was just intense. You know, losing someone that to care for is, is on the physical level. Psychological is different, but on the physical level, it, it was just, at that moment in time when you get that news, it was just uh, a rush of adrenaline. You're not moving, but your body is just going through the, the motion. And then after that, it's just, Pure sadness, loneliness. My bro is gone. And we walked the valley of the darkness together. And I thought that we would get out of the valley together, you know, and that we would see sunshine and we would go not to that mountaintop, but to another. Keep doing what we do because we love music. That's why we got into this game in the first place for the love of music, but he wasn't there anymore. And he was not gonna, he was not gonna have that, that, that precious life because I was, gro I was doing a lot of work on myself. I was reading a lot of stuff, you know, and I was starting to share that with him as well. And I was telling him, look, man, it's not, you know, the success is not everything, you know. Success is just, it's just a part of like, you know, it's a career thing. You know, you, can, you, you have to learn to live without that. And he wasn't down with that. You know, he wanted that life. That life was pretty much everything for him. Because, you know, being loved, even though his motto was, it's better to be feared than to be loved. He loved that love when people acknowledged him and gave him attention, being in the center of attention. He loved that, you know. I loved it too, but I was more of an introvert. I wasn't too down with it. My thing was, you do that. When I hit the stage, I do my thing, you know? And I got, I got with it. 
as, I, as, as we were going through the process, I, I, I grew up as well. But he was two years older. You know, so he was, he was, it was easier for him. And my thing was, from the get-go, you know, music was really what I wanted to do, you know. So when he left the building, more than ever I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this. I'm going to do my project. It was called Love Revolution. I wrote a song for him. And, um, you know, I'm marked forever. You know, those are scars that will never heal. You know, they, yes, they heal, but the fact that he didn't have to go like that, that was not necessary. He should be here, and he should have had the chance to just live another life. You know, because I, I look at life as like, you know, it's like a book with various, with different chapters. And through those chapters, you will evolve. You will grow. And if you focus on yourself, and that goes for everybody out there, it's never too late for anything. As long as you, you focus on yourself and you treat yourself like your best friend and you surround yourself with the right people when it comes to... And it, I'm not talking about, you know, music industry. I'm talking as human beings, just living life. I'm all about the dream. Go hard. Life is too short. Give it all you got. Will you continue to do music? I am in music. You became a DJ? I DJ as well, yeah. And you actually worked with some of the original vocalists of Millie Vanilli. I'm working with John Davis. We're touring in Poland, Czechoslovakia, Germany. I mean, we're touring this whole steel East Block right now and Germany. What was it like to get together? Because you guys were always separated before. Yeah, 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 yeah. So suddenly, I mean, after all this exploded and, you know, there was no, no barriers, when you guys all, did you get together with all the original? No, no, just John. John is the only guy that I, that I gel with. We have a cool vibe. And, uh, but you met the other guys? No. No? No, no, no. Hmm. Un until now, we haven't really. Brad, I met, it was real short. But John, John was brought to Los Angeles by a guy called Jace Hall. Mm -hmm. And we did a parody on video games with Mario Brothers. Okay. And that was the first time that we got a chance to chop it up, sit down, and I was like, yo, man, that dude is cool. Yeah. And since I was in, in Holland, and he was in Germany, we were like, yo, maybe we should do some gigs together. Yeah. Like, yo, really? Yeah, it'd be cool, you know? So we have this thing we call Face Meets Voice, a Millivanly experience, and that's the billing for what we do. And we play the old songs, you know, 40, 45 minutes, we're killing him. Nice. We do what we do. But yeah, it was very interesting for me to perform with him because on stage we were four people. It was two people, but it was four people. Right. And then he was doing my voice. And it was that, it was like, you know, I was performing, it was always that, that voice. So when he talks to me sometime and he says words, I'm like, yo, <laughs> flashback. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, and he's a great guy. He's a musician, accomplished musician, bass player. And, you know, we're, we're releasing music. I mean, you keep the train going. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, you have to diversify mm -hmm. your portfolio as an artist. So I work on various projects. Right. And I'm coming for your ears. I'm coming. Right, because at one point, I think you did, like, a, you were a, a spokesman for KFC. I did a, a commercial. Some commercial yeah, that yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. played off the whole Millie Vanilli yeah, thing and so exactly. forth. It was really cool. It was fun. Yeah, it was no, well I saw done. it. I, I saw, saw it. It was, it was well done. Yeah, it was, it was tasteful. Go check it out. <laughs> Fat more than KFC. Pretty cool. At this point, fast forward 20 years, or 27 uh, years. <laughs> um, do you see any royalties? Hell no. Off of your, that album? Hell no. no. Even though it continues. Hell no. You know, Even I, though my likeness is being used. Yeah. I don't see nothing. You don't see nothing. No. Because I looked on Vivo, one of the videos, like 30 million views, another 20 million views, and so forth. And no matter what happened, ultimately, these are great songs. That's it. And I'm sure they're being played. Like right now, someone's playing a Millie Vanilli song. Guaranteed. You're right. You're right. You're right. And, a lot of, and I believe a lot of babies were created <laughs> from that music. A lot Probably. of relationships were, were, you know, right. were instigated by that music. Yeah. That's it. But you never saw anything. No, nah, man. You and Frank don't talk at all. Hell no. You still feel a certain level of anger towards the whole no, situation? No, no, no. You no. don't? No. No. You can't walk through life with holding anger towards someone. I'm all about 
positive energy. He did me wrong, but you have to let it go. You got to let it go. You know, yes, I talk about, you know, people want to hear the story and, and I'm able to tell you and, and finally people are listening and people like you now more and more because through the years, you know, it's been a journey. But now I got Vlad that's like taking his time to like, because, you know, we're here, but they're here. And it's important that they really truly get how he went down because there were a lot of haters who thought that, yo, those dudes, man, now you know the story. Now you know exactly what happened. And it was not our faults. You know, we, we were naive. We fell into the trap. My dude was strong, like Platinum Rankin Studios. Like, of course you're going to trust him. Of course you're going to think that everything's on the up and up. Well, and I think that people may say what they're going to say. You know, always. when you look at people always criticize. In, in the social media world that we have today, people always criticize, that's just human nature. Mm -hmm. But I think that if you would have put 90% of people in that space and said, listen, we're gonna make you into a superstar. Well, but you didn't say that. Nobody, it wasn't like that. It was like, you gotta understand, man, there's the big studio, there's Robin Fab, you right. know, we, the track is dope, there's right. no vocals, I, yeah. That's what, that's what I'm saying. But when, you take, when you take a lot of people who haven't accomplished anything musically yet, and you give them opportunity and says, hey, you could be part of this song, and this is a dope song. I think most people would have, got, would have had the same, made the same choices that you guys made. Right, and the way it was put yeah. as well. You know, that trap was set perfectly, yeah. man. They, exactly. played us, they played us well, and that's what happens. You know, I'm not the first to have been played in the industry. You know, a lot of people came before me who suffered terribly, you know, and because because, well, the producer played them, whatever, the contract was wrong, and people get stuck, and, you know, and it's like mistakes we make because you don't have the right surroundings. Because those contracts were signed without attorney or management. He was happy. Oh, ain't nobody around? <laughs> Dope. Sign here. Here's the money, cash, right there. You can have that right now. Once we signed... Well, it was interesting when you look at what happened in the last year or so. There was the whole Drake... Meek Mill situation. Oh, yeah. Now, Meek Mill, now Drake wasn't lip syncing. No. But it was. Ghost writer. It was shown that, that he had a ghost writer. Now, when Meek Mill started going at Drake, the cover to his disc record was this right here. Oh, yeah, I saw that dude. Yeah, I was like, oh, no. Where they actually took, now this is, this is Rob, I believe. No, that's me, dude. That's you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was like, if they would have taken Rob, I was like, okay, cool. Like, so, oh, no, they took me. So, so they took <laughs> your picture and superimposed Drake's face. With his logo, right? With, with the, well, it was sort of, it was the owl logo, but it's a ghost. Right. For ghost writing yeah, 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 and yeah, so yeah, forth. Yeah. This was, in hip hop, Historically, ghostwriting is considered the biggest no-no. It's no -no. a no-no. It's blasphemy. It's blasphemy. A, a, a rapper is supposed to write their own verses, their, write their own yeah. vocals, and so forth. Meek Mill felt that he had ended Drake's career, and absolutely nothing happened. He In did. fact, Drake came back bigger than ever. He dropped his new album, which broke every, every streaming records. record ever. on Spotify. It was like 70 million streams. It, 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 was, it was ridiculous. So when you look at that, and you look at what you guys went through, how do you feel about it? Man, I can't be mad at nobody, man. You know what I'm saying? You gotta, you gotta live your life. You know, this is what happened. Like I said, you can't be bitter. You can't stay in the negative. Stay positive. If music is truly what you, what you want to do, and you have love for it, you got that bug. When you got that bug, man, you, you're never gonna, it's never gonna go away. Ever. So what am I going to do? I'm not going to fight it. I'm going to do it. I love it. And uh, no matter how long it takes, I'm going to do this. That's it. And people will, you know, people will see. Yeah. But I, obviously, I'm not working with a machine right now. So you ain't the same game. But you're still supporting yourself. Hell yeah, man. You're still healthy. You look great, by the way. You look Thank like you, you haven't, you don't look 50. Let me tell you, <laughs> tell you something. Let me tell you something. 
I was downtown doing a photo shoot. Like it was like four days. And this black dude came on the bike and he looked at me and said, you look good, so I know it's all good. Mm. You know, in a few, you know? Yeah. In a few words. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. I like that. You know, and I've learned a lot of, a lot of lessons. And health is wealth. If you don't take care of yourself, you're in trouble, my dude. So I've always known that the journey would be long. So I would have to, like, adjust and change. So at the age of 25, I stopped everything. It would be a long journey, and I'm glad that I did, because now I'm good. Yeah. And I heard they're doing a biopic. Yeah, man, with the Rat Pack. Brett Ratner. Yeah. He's involved. You know, he's, he's connected to the hip-hop community. Of course. You know, my dude knows, he knows his thing, man. He's a visionary, no doubt. So I think that the fact that we are in cahoots is a good thing. So it's, it's, it's going down. Just have to, you know, fix a few things because it's a film business, you know, scheduling and getting things in order so that when it's time to press the, the red button, yeah. everything's going to go. But, you know, we, we be coming. I mean, it's a hell of a story. Yeah, it's yeah. got everything. It's got all the elements of it's a Hollywood mm, it's good. story. It's good. Hollywood man. movie. Like one of a kind. One of a kind. And I'm, a, I'm, at the, I'm at the center of it. And I'm still here. Still healthy. Still fired up about doing music. And you know I'm going to be on that soundtrack. Yep. And I'm talking to producers that, you know, that Brett has been connecting me with. So it's going down. Well, Fab, I wish you the best. My pleasure, man. You it know. was a pleasure talking to you. I'm glad I see the face behind the voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You know, and, and I am the subject of the interview, and uh, I'm glad I did this. Yeah. I'm glad that my manager, Kimalo, was able to hook it up and coordinate because uh, I want to tell my story, and I believe that, not from a selfish, selfish standpoint, just like I believe that you should share with others. Always, because you know, there's things that you can't write down. So verbal, you know, kind of a tribal thing. And I consider myself a musician, a songwriter, and I believe that, you know, we are, by tr we are associated by tribe when it comes to artists. And I want to share with young ones out there not to do the same mistakes that I did. So by just listening to my story, you can learn. But my story is also about, you know, Making mistakes, but you can learn from your mistakes. Don't repeat the same mistakes. Move forward. Go for it. Get yours. Nothing is impossible. Just stay strong and make sure you surround yourself with good people that you can trust because sometimes the people that are the closest are not necessarily the best people for you to have around.